I'm here today with Professor Walter Dudley from the uh, University of Hawaii and he's here to uh, help us a little bit at the Australian Tsunami Research Centre with tsunami related work. He's a bit of a guru on these things and so I'm going to be asking him generally about what he does really well which is interviewing tsunami survivors, uh, those who have been through the experience because it's an extremely useful educational tool. So Walt, with regards to tsunami survivor interviewing, mm -hmm. I mean, how, how exactly do you go about that and, and what's the value of it anyway? Well, first of all, I think the value is in getting into the minds, insight into how people responded, what they were thinking, how they reacted, mm -hmm. and how they managed to survive. How do you actually go about doing that? Well, first of all, um, because this is a very traumatic experience for, for almost everyone who goes through it, mm -hmm. um, we're very careful to not offend any, any cultural sensitivities and any um, to speak to anyone who doesn't want to be to tell their story. But in fact, in most cases, when people realize that the reason we're collecting their stories is not just to save an oral history of the event that happened to their family, to their village, to their town, but to help save other people's lives, they are usually more than willing to talk. And I've interviewed some 400 different survivors over the last decade, and not a single one had received any post-traumatic stress disorder counseling. And I think nearly all of them suffered. Yeah, and I, I was going to say, I remember when we were in Indonesia mm -hmm. and we were speaking with um, Mrs. Uh, Rinaldiana yeah. um, in Bandar Aceh. Uh, what I found really interesting about that was not necessarily just the fact that we're interviewing someone who'd, who'd lost her husband, lost children, uh, was completely devastated, etc. But you could get the emotion in the video interview. That, that is extremely powerful. Um, we often find ourselves, and because you've been with us in many cases, sitting there having someone talk to us in a language that we don't necessarily understand with tears running down your face yeah. because there is so much human emotion coming across. I went up into a two-story house. It was crowded with women and children. That was when I first saw the waves, higher than a coconut tree. I shouted to my husband, run, run, run but the people downstairs couldn't yet see the water. Then the wave hit downstairs. The porch collapsed and then the rest of the house. I was carrying my young son and the house collapsed on us and then he was gone. You know, if we're gonna educate people about tsunamis, um, we have to get their attention first. We need to give them a reason to want to learn because people are bombarded with so many different messages about so many different things. And that human emotion is that powerful punch that gets people to sit up, take note, and want to learn so they and their families don't become victims. Because one of the big problems we seem to have in, in general sort of catastrophic events is trying to make people realize that it's dangerous and don't go near it. Um, I think, for example, where we just had the last tsunami warning here from the Chilean tsunami back at the end of February, and the warning went out, the warning system worked brilliantly. And thousands of people in Sydney went down to the beach to watch the tsunami. Obviously, you have a lot of work to do. But you know, we, we haven't had a Pacific-wide tsunami since 1964, and we haven't had a really large destructive one since 1960. That's the longest historic period. Mm -hmm. So even in places like Hawaii, the, um, there's you know, very few people who have actually remember an event who went through the experience. But by trying to get that message out there, mm -hmm. and we've been working very, very hard, in the islands. I know the, the previous tsunami warning in 1994, there were more than 400 surfers who stayed in the water on the north shore of Oahu throughout the event. And if that had been a large destructive event, they would have, they would have all been casualties. But this time in 2010, we had almost no one. There were two or three people. Mm -hmm. So the word is getting out there, but it's taken persistence and it's taken a powerful message to get people to wake up, pay attention, yeah, I mean, I think the further we get away from 2004 and the Indian Ocean tsunami there, the more and more relaxed people are getting again about tsunamis. Oh, you know, it's not going to happen here really, is it? You know, and if it is, it's over in the Indian Ocean. And yet what people completely and utterly forget is that the Pacific has had 85% of all known tsunamis in historic time. You know, forget the Indian Ocean. I mean, that was a horrible event. Killed, you know, hundreds of thousands of people. And yet the 1961 that happened, uh, the earthquake happened in Chile, mm -hmm. it was Pacific wide, killed hundreds of people, and caused vast amounts of damage in, in 
tens of countries. It wasn't just one or two or three or four or five. Tens of countries throughout the Pacific. Now, when that happens this time, 50 years later, mm. you look at how things have changed in the Pacific in the last 50 years. I, you know, I, I find it really difficult to even comprehend how bad it's going to be. Well, that's why our, our work is so important. Mm. So we have to get that message across, but it doesn't necessarily only work for tsunamis. I mean, there are lots of other hazards that Australia has and certainly Hawaii has. And one of the ones that you know, you've got really interested in since you've been down here is rip current uh, or rip currents and rip current survivors. And I mean, I understand you're going to do some work on that too. And well, that's been a wonderful thing for me because you have one of the world experts on rip currents and surf safety mm. here, Dr. Rob, rip current Rob, yeah. who is both a, a good scientist, but he's a passionate educator. And you're very lucky to have him here. And so I'll be working with him. Hopefully we'll be collecting some interviews with survivors, once again, to have that powerful emotional impact to help educate people. And that's an area that Hawaii, we have our work cut out for us there. So what are, what are some of the more memorable interviews that you've done? There are so many, it's really hard. And I have to tell you, um, you'll hear my voice changing here, mm -hmm. starting to catch a little bit, because when, when, when people tell you their story, they're not really telling your story, they're reliving the event. And it comes across with such emotion and power that when I think back upon them, you know, they, they begin to literally choke me up. One was a lady in Hawaii who was a little old lady sitting in her house and they had a tsunami warning and everybody thought it was gonna be a false alarm and she lost consciousness because her house collapsed on her and she woke up floating on a screen door out at sea. And miraculously, she was picked up by a Coast Guard cutter the next day. Very, very, very lucky. Um, there was a little girl in Thailand, in Renang province, on a, in a coastal village. And it was Sunday in 2004. And they were, no one was in school that day except for kids practicing for the New Year's Festival, 26th of December. Mm -hmm. And the tsunami came and destroyed the school. And she was uh, washed through the paddy fields and ultimately saved. But her, um, her mother was at home, was killed. Her brother, who was out fishing with her dad, was killed. So it's just now her and her father. Very, very difficult. And her message was, if you see the ocean behaving strangely, don't think it's no big deal. You better head to high ground. What is your advice to Australians when they hear a tsunami warning? What should they actually be doing? Well, that's really two questions. Because when the um, when a tsunami is generated far away, say, in, for example, Chile, mm -hmm. you have hours of potential warning. But people need to know what to do when they hear the warning sirens or if the police come with loudspeakers, where, however they get the warning, radio, TV, they need to have a plan, not wait until they hear it to have their plan. Um, they need to know where their loved ones are gonna be so they don't rush into a danger because they think that's where their child is and then in fact make their child an orphan. It just happened all over the world. But the other situation is when a tsunami is generated so close by that there's not time for the warning center to operate. And you know, it's not just giant earthquakes which cause tsunamis, it's also landslides. Mm. And that can happen along any coastline. And so that people need to be able to recognize Mother Nature's warning signs. Um, if the water suddenly withdraws or surges inland, or if they hear a strange loud noise from out at sea, that could be Mother Nature saying a tsunami's on its way mm. and you head to high ground. I mean, it's really good to have the opportunity of you actually being here for a, for a long period of time so we can go out we can specifically go out and interview rip current survivors, but equally we can sit here, work together and make sure that the Australian Tsunami Research Centre is going to be working better and actually focusing on educating people as well as we can. We've got to learn from the experts. And I'd like to thank you really very much for being here. Well, it's a great pleasure to be here and to help in any way I can the great work that you've been doing. Thanks so much, Walt.